fishing. Even when you're in the mood, let's go fishing. Well, it's just me and you. Head on down to the fishing hole. Grab your hat, get your pole. Let's go fishing. When you're in the mood. Canadian Sport Fishing is brought to you by Rapala. Premium fishing gear crafted from experience. Yamaha. Conquer Outdoors. Bait Cloud. Bring the fish to you. Dickies. Quality workwear since 1922. You know, living in Canada, one of the things that I've come to appreciate is the definite season that we have. In the winter time, it gets really cold. And in the summer, for about three months, we have great weather. Loving to fish, and especially to fish for bass and pike, I take advantage of those three or four months of good weather, and I try to get out as much as I can. One of my favorite things to do, especially in late summer, is to grab my kayak, my fishing gear, and my pup mulligan, and head to a small lake usually one that doesn't have a boat launch and that sometimes is hard to get into. And even if I only have three or four hours of fishing, I want to enjoy some peace and solitude. There's nothing like being in a kayak, especially if it's a calm day, paddling around, hearing the birds, a lot of Canada geese, which are common, sometimes seeing loons, and just taking in that environment. And then, of course, there's the fishing. One thing I love is to get out in a kayak. A lot of times you can get into places with a kayak that you can't get with a larger boat, and they're so portable. And I just enjoy being with Mulligan, and this close to the water. <laughs> Got a nice uh, shower of rain there, of water. Let me just get him close here. Now this guy, I don't even know if he's hooked. I thought it was a bass, because I'm trying to fish this weed line. I'll try grabbing him. Um, he hit a pig and jig. I haven't used a flipping jig with pork rind for a long time. It's orange, um, it's called a lizard, and then I've got about a quarter ounce flipping jig. So when you get in a lot of these back lakes, especially ones that um, are seldom fished, you get a mix of pike and bass. This guy should take off, I didn't have him on long. So the advantage that I have, I've got my Raymarine right at the front, and it's really good because right now I'm in about five feet of water. Because it's early in the day, I'm starting shallow. I'll even move to like 15 to 25 foot depth. So right now I'm kind of fishing the shallower stuff. I mean, it's not shallow by bass standards, because it's like five to 10 feet. But you can see behind me, it's real shallow water. During the hot summer months, a lot of the smaller lakes warm up rather quickly, and then you get a lot of vegetation growth. And most of the fish that are in those lakes, especially if they're fish like bass and pike, will go into the new weeds and they'll feed very heavily. But as you get into late summer and those weeds start to die, those same fish start to move off the shorelines. Right off the weed edge. Let's see if this is a bass or a pike. Oh, it looks like a pike. I can see it. Oh, now see, normally for pike, you use flashy lures and stuff. This is interesting. He hit that purple goo bug. Okay, there's the first. That was interesting. I think the first time I've had a fish jump inside the kayak on the worm hook. Look, a nice long fish. Big head, big mouth. It's gonna easily, come on, go away. Did he take my grub? Some bass and pike remain feeding in the shallow water, but many of them move off to the first structure break, which is anywhere from about eight to 15 feet, or even deeper down as far as 20 feet. There, they look for the same fish that were in the shallow water, a lot of times smaller panfish, and also larger bait fish, 
and they look for them cruising up and down those shoreline breaks and those weed lines to feed on them. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you by MD Marine Insurance. Boat insurance made easy. Pike and bass really cohabitate the same areas and they feed literally on the same food. When both fish get larger in size, let's say over two or three pounds, they start to feed primarily on smaller fish. That's where angling for them and using a variety of artificial lures, hard lures like crankbaits and also soft plastic is a really good way to catch them. What I like to do on a given day is I start out early and I fish shallower because most of the time, early in the morning, the fish do tend to go a little bit shallower to feed in water from five to 10 feet deep. And one of my favorite techniques to use, especially if there are weeds in those areas, is to use a soft plastic bait. I like to use a plastic worm from six to eight inches long, rig Texas style, or a four to five inch crayfish type soft plastic that I can also rig Texas style. Nice hit. Come on, let me see ya. Nice size bass. There's just something about warm summer days and bass fishing. Look at how gorgeous this largemouth is. He's so well proportioned. He's really thick. I don't know how old he is, but uh, he's in great shape. Not a gorgeous largemouth? Look at. I got him on a soft plastic. I was just throwing a worm around because I've been alternating between the Arashi Deep 18 and then uh, using the soft plastics, and that guy hit a soft plastic with just a very tiny worm weight. I don't know if you can see that worm weight. It's only about maybe uh, one eighth of an ounce or even lighter. There we go. Nice sized bass. Beautiful largemouth. I mean, this is fun. This is amazing. The bass fishing was actually slower earlier. It's about a quarter to two, and the bass are picking up. Look at this, gorgeous largemouth. He soaked just nicely in the roof of the mouth. He tried. What I've done is go with a five inch, I'd call it like a crayfish grub. It's a little creature grub. Isn't that a nice largemouth? You can actually see the grub right there. I had a Texas rigged on just a worm hook with about a one eighth ounce weight. So I'm gonna just unhook him. He wasn't gonna get off, hooked in the roof of the mouth. Isn't that a beautiful large mouth? We're just doing some yakking out here, kayaking. I'll tell you what, this Catch 120 is a lot of fun. I just had to go to shore to look after some personal business. And uh, I just went right through the reeds, which is kind of nice, because you can't really do that with a big boat. And stepped out of it, there he goes. One of my favorite presentations is to use a flipping jig and also a piece of pork rind. Pork rind is old school. You know, a lot of fishermen today use a plastic trailer on their flipping jig, but I really like the lifelike action and also the smell that the pork rind gives off. <clears throat> Let's see what this is gonna be here. Got some weight to it. Oh, I think it's a bass. Yeah, nice large mouth. <laughs> That's it. As our friend Steve Starling from Australia used to say, give it stick. So I've got the drag crank down because I don't want it to go down in those weeds. That fish was in about 14 feet of water. So you know, my strategy coming into today was starting shallow, like 10, 14 feet, which isn't super shallow, but then working my way to like 20 feet of water. See if I can bring this guy around. So he really grabbed that. That was interesting because he was just off the weeds. You know, and there's that bug. So you know, pike and bass can live in harmony. They feed on the same food. Later on when I'm gonna be casting a crankbait, you know, some of the bigger fish learn to feed off in deeper water because those bait fish, especially panfish, are migrating from the shallows. And that's a really good time to intercept them with crankbaits. When you go with a worm hook, you know, you've got so much power because the hook is so round and long. There, nice chunky largemouth. It's gonna take off real quick. 
That water's starting to cool off. It's that time of year. I find that the shadow wrap casts really well and it has the profile of a classic bait fish. I start by casting perpendicular to shore because I want to make sure to intercept any of the fish that are on their way to the deeper water. If that doesn't produce fish, I may cast parallel to shore where I'm covering the 10 to 20 foot break. Sometimes I twitch it very aggressively to make it dart from side to side. Other times I just use a steady retrieve. In both cases, it has the same effective wobble. It just doesn't have the slashing action if you just retrieve it. But I've caught fish using both presentations. Wow, what a stick of dynamite. Man, I think he was trying to get off. OK, Let's see if I can unhook him carefully. We don't want to hurt you, Mr. Pike. We just want to have some fun with you. It's one way to get them off. Better check the hooks. Yep, some are straightened. You know, fishing a slash bait in the middle of the day is pretty exciting, especially when you're this close to the water. Um, I've had a few fish follow, like, really close to the kayak. So I wouldn't be surprised if one slams it in the future when that, I'm about to lift the rod up and takes the rod right under the boat. I guess if that happens, we're going to find out how strong the rod is. So that fish really did a number on the hooks. You know, these uh, shadow wrap deep have like really sharp hooks, but they're lightweight. So you have to always check them, especially when you get a fish like that. It just goes berserk on the surface. When you're looking for fish that move off of shorelines into that deeper water, it really helps to figure out where there's a sudden depth change or where the weeds actually meet the deeper water in 15, even 20 feet deep. That's where a fish finder is very important. I rely on my Raymarine. I have a dragonfly that's actually portable. I can rig it onto the kayak or I can take it off. And it is very accurate. I usually have it on the down vision so I can see all the details. That way I know exactly where I should have the kayak position and how I should be casting to locate those deeper water feeding fish. Oh, there's a fish right after. Come on, come on, come on. You gonna hit it? The pipe go for, oh, he's on it. <laughs> I was trying to do a figure eight. That was kind of cute. He's not a monster, but you know what? To see him follow like that is beautiful. I've been very fortunate here because I haven't got tagged with a hook handling these northerns. They are tricky. They usually thrash when you get one hook out. Notice I got my hand up the line. If he wants to thrash, by all means, he had all three hooks tacked onto him. Just trying to get the one there. There, good release. A nice largemouth for a change. Come on. But he was definitely out away from the real shallow stuff. So this guy's a classic late, late summer fish. Let's see if I can land him. Um, boy, he, uh, how am I gonna grab him here? He's got that shadow wrap kind of underneath, maybe. How about like this? Is he gonna stay still for me? Good, and good. Nice large mouth, there's that shadow wrap. Tell you what, I've got a lot of confidence in that lure. Um, early in the year, middle of the day, doesn't matter. It produces fish. I guess I even casting from shore. See, those hooks are small, but man, do they stick. So I'm just gonna get that one out. Not bad for a, like a one o'clock fish in the middle of the day, getting these nice uh, large mouth. It's actually quarter to one. Just having fun, you know, relaxing in the sun. Got my puppy with me, eh, Mulligan? She doesn't mind this either. 
And look, in a kayak, it's quiet. I can go right through the shallow stuff, no problem. Um, pretty easy to also take a nap. I'll tell you, this is very relaxing. At the same time that I'm casting out from shore, I always keep my eyes open to see if there's any features along the shore, like a fallen tree, or maybe a tree stump sticking out of the water, or an isolated patch of lily pads. Those are fish magnets, both for pike and bass. And even though my plan is to fish deeper, I'll kind of go in closer, especially if the tree looks like it goes out into deeper water, and I'll make a few target casts right to the area. Those are real high percentage areas, and even when most of the fish have left to go into deeper water, you can still find some stragglers around that structure or cover. Good, you didn't swallow that crankbait. My plier's right here. It's a nice thing about being on the in the kayak, you got everything really handy. <laughs> it's not, are you gonna, oh, I'll jump in the boat. Okay, this is that Arashi Deep 18. I'm not fishing 18 feet of water yet, I'm fishing about 12, but I'm working my way out to that deep, deeper water. Come here. And I'm glad this guy isn't hooked too deep. That's good, go from one treble hook to the other. I'll tell you, it helps to have long nose pliers. There he goes. Yeah, this is the slewer. It, it's got a really nice uh, lip, so it goes down deep. But what I like about the Arashi is, where the eye is, it's not stuck, like not cemented into the actual lip. There's an arm underneath and it actually moves. So it never runs off tune. It kind of balances itself. And this one seems to be just the right size for both largemouth bass and pike. As the day progresses, there's another crankbait that I like to use. It's the Arashi Deep 18. This lure will actually dive down more than 18 feet, especially if you're using a low diameter braided line. The Arashi is ideal because it's got a wide body, so it floats. When you cast it out, especially if you're fishing some of the shallower weed beds or some of the shorelines, if you think you're gonna come up to some weeds, all you do is pause your presentation and the Arashi will rise up, then you can crank it again. It has a long lip and a beautiful side-to-side -side rattle. And it also has rattles inside that make like a clacking sound. And I find that when you combine the rattles with the motionless presentation where you let that crankbait rise up, a lot of times that's when you get hits. Now I like to fish the Arashi a little bit deeper. So what I'd like to do is position the kayak in about 20 or 30 feet of water and I'll often lower the anchor down so I can make a few casts in all directions. And I cast it so that I'm covering that 10 to 20 foot depths. A lot of times both bass and pike will actually suspend out in deeper water but they'll only be down maybe 10 or 15 feet even if the water's 20 or 30 feet deep. So using a lure like the Arashi Deep 18 is a really good way to get those fish to hit that lure. <laughs> you know, in a lot of places up north, these are the guys that you keep for eating. I like that this guy has just one back hook. <laughs> I don't even want to pull the weeds off with my hand. You know what I mean? Because if he thrashes, Mm, yep, so I'll just use this to pluck the weeds off. Hopefully it won't jump, because I gotta get to see where the hook is. I see it. Mm -hmm. Stop. Good thing you listen to me. A lot of times when you grab them, just where the gill plates meet the body, they open their mouths. It's like that, so we're not hurting him, I'm not touching his gills. That's a prime example of a back lake northern that competes with bass for food. Play the sleeper, good. <music> Kayak fishing has really grown in popularity over the last 20 years. Today, fishermen have so many choices for specialized fishing kayaks. I'm fortunate because I'm using the Catch 120, which is a state-of-the-art fishing kayak that can be loaded with all kinds of accessories to help fishermen catch more fish. 
The catch weighs in at 70 pounds and it has a carrying capacity of 400 pounds. So it's actually lightweight for one person to put in and out of a truck or even to put it on top of a car. Personally, I've always liked to fish out of a sit-on-top kayak as opposed to a sit-in kayak. What I look for in a kayak is a kayak that's very stable. Whether I'm standing up or sitting down, I have to be comfortable. If I'm fishing for two, three, four hours and I don't plan on going to shore, it's very important that you're comfortable in your kayak. For maximum stability, the catch has a nice flat platform. You can actually stand up in front of your seating area, but it also has a unique tunnel hull, which really stabilizes it, not just if you're standing up, but also if you're paddling or if you're sitting and casting, even if the weather gets a little bit rougher. Yak Attack is one of the foremost companies that sells accessories for serious kayakers, especially for fishermen. So whether it was the ram mounts that I have for the rod holders, or whether the actual box that I have my Raymarine in, my storage box for the back, my kayak anchor wizard that helps me if I want to stop in one spot and cast, all those are from Yak Attack, and they're very easy to install. The only thing that's actually permanent on the kayak are the rails. All of the other accessories come off and are put on very easily. I'm keeping that rod tip close to the water so I got lots of room to set the hook. Oh, what a hit! <laughs> Another nice fish. I got my sunglasses on, that's good. I can't get over how much these fish jump. Yes, another high five. Okay, and so there. You got off, I don't have to handle it perfect. Canadian Sport Fishing is brought to you by Rapala, premium fishing gear crafted from experience. Yamaha, conquer outdoors. Bait Cloud, bring the fish to you. Dickies, quality workwear since 1922. This is, uh, it's not a color that a lot of guys would throw. It's almost like black. It's got flake on top, dark sides, see-through, and then that uh, white on the belly with a little bit of like an orangey color near the throat. The reason I've gone with this color is because we've got such bright conditions. It's the middle of the day. So I want to go natural because the water's pretty clear here. And it seems to be working. That was the first really good hit. It's going to position the kayak. Look at this wood. Man, you'd think there'd be a bass in the deeper water just off it. So all I'm doing is just casting out and just some light twitches of my rod. This is the shadow wrap deep, so I can fish it as deep as I want. It's almost like a count on Rapala, but it's got that dynamic slashing action from left to right. 